So what I'd like to do today is a talk, talk about mixed methods. And before I get started, I'd like to, you know, ask you a few questions. Um, because mixed methods, I don't, I don't know how much you know about mixed methods, and I don't want to review stuff that you already know. So let's start by, uh, how, would, how would you define quantitative research? Numbers. Numbers. I hear numbers. Polls and polls, like polls and data and polls. Surveys and Surveys, polls. Yeah. That's right. okay. Good. Those are forms of of, quali of quantitative research. That's right. Um, random sampling. Random sampling. Okay. Good. All pieces of quantitative research. Uh, and and how? And all right. So and what about qualitative research? How would you define qualitative research? When you think about qualitative research, what do you think of? Please. Uh, like people's experiences, their opinions, their thoughts. On. Focusing on people's actual experiences. Okay. Good. What else? Things that just can be quantified or like assigned a value to it. You can quantify qualitative data. You're right. Okay. Um, so let's let's kind of I'm going to compare and contrast quantitative and qualitative research methods briefly, and then we'll get to what mixed methods is, because we all have kind of different conceptions of what that is. So as you, as some of you suggested, um, with the kind of data that is collected when you do quantitative work, uh, typically emphasizes some kind of numerical rating, so numbers are involved, versus in qualitative where there's words involved. Um, quantitative research tends to be quite structured, Whereas qualitative research, in addition to words, can look at images, but it, and it tends to draw on semi-structured or even open-ended kinds of evidence. Does that make sense? Um, and then uh, examples, some of you named some of these. So examples of quantitative research include things like surveys, um, using standardized assessments, uh, all the tests that too many of you have taken over the years. Those are quantitative. <laughs> Um, and then qualitative examples of, and there are lots of different kinds of, 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 of uh, research under each of these categories, but I'm giving you the ones that you might be most familiar with. Um, examples from qualitative, the qualitative realm include interviews, ethnographic observations, focus groups, okay? Um, and then, you know, so the, one thing is what the, gather, the data that you gather, uh, another thing is the data that you analyze and how you analyze it. And as one of you suggested, you can quantify qualitative, um, qualitative research. But quantitative research tends to draw on descriptive statistics, the mean, the, you know, the medium, the range, um, analysis of variance, chi-squares. You don't have to remember all of these, but I'm just kind of giving you examples that you've probably heard floating around or read about. Uh, inferential statistics are more predictive. They predict, you use the numbers to predict certain uh, things. So multiple regression analysis, structural equation modeling, these are examples of inferential statistics. Qualitative data tends to draw on coding. Typically it's coded in some way. Uh, and it can be deductive codes. So deductive is when you already have some hunches, perhaps drawn on theory or previous uh, research. And you already come up, come to the analysis with some ideas about what you want to analyze and how you're going to analyze it, and, and codes already mapped out. Inductive is when you draw, you let the evidence percolate up from the data with no pre-existing lenses of any kind. Uh, that's a lot of you have heard of grounded theory, perhaps. Is that yeah? I'm seeing nodded heads. That tends to be inductive coding, and you can do either or both in different ways. Um, and you can, you know, there's thematic analyses. And then there's some basic philosophical assumptions that are quite distinct from each other. So in quantitative research, uh, the, you know, the belief is that everything, all experience can be, it is fixed. It's the same for most groups and it's, me it's measurable in some way. And that re there is such a thing as reality, okay? Whereas uh, the philosophical assumptions of quant qualitative work is, is much more dynamic, 
there is no fixed reality. Every person's experience could be different. Every group's experience could be different. It's, it's much more open-ended. Now, these are very broad characterizations, but I think it's important to start before we get into mixed methods with the idea of what those two typologies may be. Okay? Any questions so far? Another, I have one more question of you. Uh, how many of you, if you had to assign yourself a type of research style, would put yourself in the quantitative camp? Okay. Uh, and how many would you put yourself in the qualitative camp? Okay, a little few more in qualitative. And um, so, and the reasons why people choose one uh, methodology or another sometimes has to do with simply exposure. If you're in certain departments, you're going to get a lot more training, a lot more quantitative training, for example, than other departments where you're going to get more qualitative training. Some of it is a philosophical assumption. Uh, you belief systems about which, you, you, which approach you think is better or worse. And the more, va most valid reason is because the kinds of research questions you ask are quite distinct from one another. Okay? So, so what, when, we, when we think about mixed methods, who's got a working definition in their head of what mixed methods is? Doesn't have to be full or, you know, we're working through this through together. Okay, yes? Go by the two. You combine the two. <laughs> right, there's a visual hit. Uh, okay, all right, very good. Uh, any other uh, definitions? I, I think that's how you're. Oh, I was basically going to say um, when you use elements of both. Okay, that's, that's also true. Any other thoughts? Would maybe like the Likert scale be kind of like an example of the. Like Likert scales are pretty quanti are quantitative. Mm -hmm. Although you can code evidence to be qualitative data to go along a scale, but Likert implies that you have one to seven range or one to five range, and your participant is asked or, or is asked to basically uh, choose one of the one point on the scale. So that's a forced choice kind of uh, situation. So that would be quantitative. Please. Um, you use data from both types of method methods to support your argument. Yes, or uh, draw on those two. So that those those so that's so that's so you some of you have working models in your head. I'm going to try to take it just a little deeper today for you. Uh, give you some examples of different types of of, uh, of research that is using mixed method strategies. Uh, tell you a little bit about what the why you would want to use mixed methods. I'm not here to sell anything. I'm just here to sort of get you to to think about why mixed methods has some advantages. I'm also going to tell you about some of the disadvantages um, and then give you a few little tips as you go on the voyage of doing this kind of work if you decide you want to do this kind of work. Make sense? So that's the roadmap of where we're going today. So here are some core characteristics of this mixed methods. So in mixed methods, uh, you collect as well as analyze uh, persuasively and rigorously using both forms of evidence. Okay. Um, you mix these two forms of evidence. And the mixes can happen in a number of different ways. None of you have to memorize anything I'm telling you today. My slides will be available to you if you'd like them. So you can even, like, you know, it's good to process in writing because you know what you hear, you think, and you, know, you remember it better. But you, you can have access to these slides it's, it, if it'll be helpful to you down the line. Okay? Uh, all right, so when you're mixing these two forms of evidence, it can happen at different points in time. So it can happen concurrently. So you're, um, you're gathering the evidence and analyzing the evidence at the same time. It can happen sequentially. So you, do, you collect one type of evidence and then another form of evidence. Um, and then the last way is you're embedding one form of evidence within the other. So you're drawing from, for example, a, subsa a subsample of one type of quantitative data to do qualitative analyses. So, that, so do you see the difference between those three strategies? Okay. And n now, you, some people uh, give exactly equal weight to both kinds of data. And some people would do what I would call light on one side of the equation versus the other. They're light on the quantitative side or light or they're light on the quanti uh, on the yeah, flip side, qualitative <laughs> side. Um, so 
you know, that is, so you can, and then other people, as I say, are doing, you know, both forms of reverence are getting exactly the same kinds of priority. So what else? Uh, what are some other characteristics? In mixed methods, researchers use, uh, can use these procedures in a single study, or they can use it in a program of research. So what does that mean? You, you, you know, you can get funding, or you can propose a, a study where you're using both types of evidence. And I'm going to emphasize that you need to use, choose to use these forms of evidence strategically. Just don't do it willy-nilly because it will be neat. Do it because you have a reason, because your research questions are, 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 are driving the need for both forms of methods. So that's going to be one of the take-home messages for the day. Um, so it can be in the same study. You're going to the same place with talking to the same folks, uh, getting gathered data, quantitative and qualitative data from the same group of people, and then you kind of come up with your, uh, your conclusions. Or it can be part of a program of research, like I may do a quantitative study first, and then what, from what I've learned from that, I'm going to the next phase is qualitative, and then you can do another study that's deeper, another kind of qualitative method. You can, so you can move around if you're studying a, popul a, a group of people, for example, a, a set of questions. Okay? If you're ever, I, I will try to roll out explanations as I go, but I welcome questions if anything's not clear. Okay? Um, and these, these, these uh, strategies, typically are drawn on philosophical and uh, theore you know, philosophical assumptions that have with certain theoretical lenses. Um, you know, my own belief is that for the kind of work that I do with the populations that I work with, both strategies are absolutely essential for um, much of the work. And I'll give you some more examples. So I do research on immigration and how it affects children and families. Um, and a lot of the methods that are available for work on, on uh, immigrant populations is, you know, not have not been uh, standardized for uh, the group, groups that I've worked with. So that means that we need a qualitative phase where we're uh, working with trying to uh, adapt measures uh, to the to groups that we're working with. And then when, we, when we're done, then we can do a, you know, do the same uh, piece, gather the same piece of evidence from everyone, and then the next phase is often going back to the, to the groups that I've done research with and asking them, do the, does the evidence make sense? Uh, and why and why not? So that when you, when you or I report, we can feel pretty confident we are uh, getting as close to truth as we can. If there is, I would um, you know, suggest there's no full, full truth. There's never 100% truth, but we can do a lot better than um, the, the, uh, what's happening in the media these days, right? Uh, and the more pieces of evidence you have that point in the same direction, with the more both points of view, the more likely you are to get to an approximation of truth. Okay, so that's what, that's my philosophical assumption. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also, you know, I, I am in a point in my life where I don't want to describe anymore. I want to create change. And that requires uh, a lot of, you know, it, moving back and forth between these kinds of strategies. Um, and, uh, and so the, the, the another, kind of, another core characteristic of mixed methods is that it combines procedures uh, with specific designs. This is what I'm, I'm going to now roll out some examples of specific designs. These are typologies. You don't have to memorize them. There's, I will give you the resource where you can find out about if you ever want to make use of these particular typologies. Um, but I want to kind of give you a sense of how these, I want to take it out of the abstract and kind of take it into some real life examples of research. All right, so. Uh, so one form, so I'm going to roll out four different kinds of uh, classic mixed method studies. And there's lots of variations on what gets done, but these are kind of the, the you, you could usually put yourself in one of these four typologies to a certain degree. So the first one is called the, huh, okay, there it is. Sorry, <laughs> I was not seeing it for a second. So the first one is called the explanatory sequential design. So what do you notice here? I can talk. Yeah, go ahead, please. I, I think it's more interesting when it's interactive. There's quantitative and qualitative. Right, so that's the mixing. Which one comes first? Quantitative. The quantitative. So 
uh, one of the features of the explanatory method is that you start with a quantitative, you collect your quantitative data, then you follow up with a qualitative study, and then you make sense of it. So that's, that's one classic variation. Now, so for example, these are two examples of, a, of studies that with that, that typology. You could collect, uh, research could collect data with a quantitative instrument that's already been used, uh, and then do some qualitative focus groups to figure out whether the findings they have are making sense uh, to the population under concern. Um, and then they'll see, then they'll see if, then they put the, they'll do an analysis, and then they'll see if it's, you know, how do the two pieces of evidence speak to each other? Where is one uh, deepening the understanding of the other? Um, so, so that's one example. Another example is when the, 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 the researcher does an experiment um, and then follows up with interviews with a few individuals to find out what their experience of that process was and what they were really thinking when they decided to do X, Y, or Z. So that's a classic uh, explanatory uh, study. Then an exploratory study, what do we notice here? Well, gotta tell me if I don't have the right side. <laughs> <laughs> it's going like, really? Uh, okay. okay, thank you. It starts off with qualitative, so once you kind of have that better idea of what it is and you know what you want, what kind of quantitative research you want to do? Yeah, exactly. Or, 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 or even if you want to adapt a uh, measure, for example, that's exactly right. So you're, it's, this one flips the order. Okay, uh, so examples of, uh, so an example of this is the researcher interviews individuals to describe a topic. So for example, uh, family separations, what is that experience like? What, you know, so you can talk to, to families about that, or, or parent-child diet, diets, or caretaker diet, child diets, to hear about what, how, you know, what are some of the issues that come up, and then you can, uh, develop a uh, survey instrument that could ask a number of people about that experience. Um, and then, um, all right, so I'm still back here. And then you see if, if you can generalize the findings. Yes? I'm going to try and use this mic. Okay. okay. Hello? Yeah, okay, cool. that's good. Um, do you find the last two that you've mentioned, the exploratory and the sequential, do you find that one is often used a lot more than the other, or are they both used? No, they're really, they're, they're all used quite quite often. I'm going to go through a couple more. So the explanatory, I mean, typically the, um, the uh, explanatory quant dominant folks tend to use that approach. So the, it's almost, and, and often you'll see it lightly sprinkled into the study. And that will be one of my critiques uh, of the way mixed methods has gotten sort of a bad name because people are don't really think through why they're using it, and they're so dominant in one uh, approach that they don't necessarily know how to do the other very well. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of sloppy mixed methods running around. Um, so we'll, we'll keep talking about that, but that, that's an excellent question. So another form of research is the convergent study. Um, and here, the two are being gathered at the same time, and each has equal dominance. So you're, you're gathering, you're spending as much time and energy and, and resources to collect each type of data. Then you make sense of it, that's the, the, the comparison and relation stage, and then you uh, interpret your evidence. Okay, I've done a lot of that kind of work, but I've also done a lot of sequential work. And then, so an example of this is uh, the a, a research could could administer a, a standardized instrument, you know, an IQ test, a language proficiency test, uh, an academic engagement uh, assessment. Psychologists love to do that. How many of you are psycho psycho psychology oriented? Okay, how many of you are sociology oriented? Okay, any other? Uh, Disciplines represent here. Education. Education. Okay. I'm sort of. I'm a psychologist who does education, uh, with a sociological twist. So <laughs> I like, you know, complicated identities. Okay. All right. But I also like to know who I'm talking to. So thanks for letting me know that. Okay. So, um, so in this case, you would, uh, you know, a psychologist would administer a standardized test, of which they've spent a whole lot of energy developing a lot of different kinds of standardized tests. 
Um, and then concurrently they begin to, they do a subsample, and that's why they embed it, of the, of the study. So an example I've done is I've done surveys of 600 people, and then I've interviewed 60 from that group. Uh, to you know, to go in deeper about what was what you know, I could we could describe patterns with the quantitative evidence, but you're not really explaining as much as you'd like to. Okay. Um, and it, it, with the embedded design, sometimes it's quant dominant, and sometimes it's qual dominant. Sometimes the embedded is in the small in the in, but typically the quantitative evidence is the bigger data set, and then the qualitative is the smaller data set. Does anybody have any ideas why that might be so? I think it, sometimes it's usually easier to, to do quantitative data just faster. Yeah. Faster. I don't know if it's easier, but it's it's faster and it's more efficient. Um, and that is why it's you know, and you can collect it on more people. Do you have good recruitment strategies? Okay, so. You know, if I'm talking and what I'm saying doesn't line up with what you're hearing, tell me please, because what I see on my screen is one slide behind. Okay? So if you're, if I'm, if, if I'm gesticulating to something that isn't there, tell me to push forward. Okay? Give me a hint. Um, I won't feel disrespectful. Okay. Um, and so, as I, so this is an example of an embedded design, right? Okay. Um, so what kinds of problems would you want to try to approach using a mixed method design? That's the next kind of set of, 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 question, of uh, slides I'm going to go through. So you may find that one data source just doesn't answer the questions you need, doesn't, isn't sufficient to get to what you wanted to learn about. Or you might find you know, your initial quantitative findings from the survey are mysterious. So an example, um, I did a study of 400 immigrant uh, young people, uh, 12 year, on average 12 years old, and I asked them about their migratory experience, and it, I, I found quantitatively that over 75% had been separated during the migratory experience. So sometime during migration, they had been separated anywhere from six months to 10 years. So quantitatively, I was able to establish that, right? And then I had different groups of people in my study, so I had Haitian origin students, I had Mexican origin students, Central American, uh, Dominican, and uh, Chinese participants. And while, so the 75% the number was across the sample, when you went into certain groups, the separation rates were much higher, like over 90%. So amongst the Haitians and Central Americans, uh, separations were much longer, and you know, it's almost Almost no one didn't get you know, experience separation at some point in the migration. So the quantitative data told me that, but that didn't really tell me much about how parents and kids managed the process, or how you know how did they stay in touch when they were apart? What was the reunification like? You know, just sort of what what does it mean? I mean, that as a psychologist, that was a big deal to realize this is so prevalent. This is before this particular administration, this was a number of years ago. So to find that was uh, impressive and worrisome. And so then my research team and I decided to go in more deeply and ask uh, a subsample of folks who had uh, been through different kinds of uh, lengths of separations to ask them a series of questions. And we interviewed the parents as well as the kids. So that's the qualitative next phase. And it was the same kids that were in the other sample, so it was embedded. Does that make sense? It just you don't have to memorize any of this, but it gives you a sense of what it can what it can look like. Okay. Um, so another sometimes we uh, uh, researchers have uh, gathered uh, qualitative evidence, and then they want to show how the you know how often something happens or uh, how prevalent something is. So they follow up with uh, a, a quantitative study after the exploratory phase because they want to be able to generalize and say they don't want to say oh this was true for the 15 people I interviewed. They want to be able to say this is more pre this is prevalent in the following ways. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so it's often a secondary method to enhance the the primary the first prime the, the the study's primary method. 
Um, and it, it's clear to the researcher that you can't really understand what you want to understand without, without doing it this way. What are some other reasons? Uh, so let's talk about the advantages now of using mixed methods. Okay. Um, so does anyone has anyone ever read a mixed method study? Okay, so this is really abstract, right? It doesn't it, this is like a, you've heard this thing is out there, but you haven't read that many studies. I think I read one. Okay. There's an econ econ study. Oh, sorry. I think I read an econ study conducted in Harvard that was released this year. Uh, they used a mixed methods approach. They interviewed um, uh, quote unquote native populations of uh, different countries that are facing large um, waves of immigration. Mm -hmm. And they took in um, demographic numbers and um, they used standard, um, measures. You know, standard measures. And then they interviewed um, people within that population to find common threats in how they viewed the migration policies mm -hmm. and whatnot. So you read both parts of the study. Did they complement one another? Oh, you know, did you trust one form of evidence more than the other form of evidence? What was your reaction to that? Um, I, I thought, I, I, didn't see, I didn't doubt either mm -hmm. source. I, I thought they helped to explain the story in both ways, that um, you know, there's, there's more to just the numbers, but then also um, you need to find the sort of macro explanation of what's going on, and that's where I felt the quantitative information in. And if you were interested in Stenchiva at all, uh, mm -hmm. that's the group that did it. And I, I thought it really did complement it. It helped explain both on the macro and micro level. Good. So you could sort of, so the qualitative data takes you into the experience of something, right? Yes. Um, exactly. And the quantitative tells you, well, how often does something happen? What does it predict? What's it related to? And, and, and that's how they kind of speak to each other. Um, so with good, good mixed method study, uh, each, the strength of each method offsets the weaknesses of the other. Uh, it provides additional evidence that you might not have uh, seen before. Um, and it helps to answer questions that simply can't be answered with one approach. Um, other advantages, it provides a bridge between researchers who typically say, I'm a quant researcher, or no, I'm a qual researcher. People tend to take these identities on. It's one of many identities we may have. Um, and, you know, this is, and, it, you know, when you have a well-crafted mixed method study, a quantitative researcher may suddenly read some qualitative perspectives they might not have read otherwise. Uh, or a qualitative researcher can say, oh, this, is, this happens in other groups as well, or this happens, it's more likely to happen under X kinds of circumstances. It, it gives a, a, a sense of perspective. Um, and encourages people to think outside the box and, and use different kinds of worldviews, realizing that, okay, truth is Something we are all, if we're social scientists, we all want to approach truth. That's why we're here. We wouldn't be in this uh, game, in this pursuit, if we didn't believe that we were, that you know, trying to understand what's going on in life, so social phenomena, is important. Uh, and we don't want to be describing pineapples when we really would, are trying to understand bananas, right? So we want to use um, strategies that 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 push us outside of our usual worldview space. Um, Sometimes folks think of this as practical research, meaning it has an application to real life, and it's oriented to solving problems, and that's one of the reasons I'm attracted to this work, uh, because it is problem-solving oriented. Questions so far? Okay. Um, so, so what are some of the challenges of doing this kind of work? Does anybody have some thoughts about what they might be? Because the data produced from both methods is com conflicting with each other? Sometimes they don't converge, and then you have to make sense of the fact that they're not speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. Ideally, they enhance in some way. There's like a putting them, you know, one's mm -hmm. using the telescope and the other one's using a microscope, and they're mm -hmm. looking at phenomena just with a different perspective. But sometimes they're arguing with one another, and then you're going, well, which one do I believe? Yeah, Please. Exactly. Doesn't ask you. What do you do? What do you do? That's what I was going to ask you. What do you do in situations like that? Which one do you trust, or which one do you decide to publish or support? Or? Yeah. Well, you know what you what you do is if something is really not speaking to the other, then you 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 ask yourself why not? What is it about you know what is it about 
the way we ask these questions, or the folks that we talk to, that might help to explain why this, they're in such deep contradiction to one another. Typically, it's not in deep, deep contradiction, but it can be. And so sometimes you may have uh, an instrument that wasn't culturally valid, you know, that was, uh, it wasn't really getting, or you were asking what you thought were related questions, but you're asking them in such different ways to different people that, of course, you're getting different kinds of answers. So what you have to do is grapple. Uh, and, uh, and then sometimes you have to discard one of the forms of evidence because you realize, oh, I can't trust this, not because you don't like the conclusions. You, can, you never get to throw it out because you don't like the conclusions, but you can throw out a, you know, part of your evidence because you realize it was a flawed measure or you didn't sample in a way that makes sense, right? And then another way to reconcile is go back and go, go deeper with either one of the strategies. So that's another way you can reconcile differences. Um, and then a, a third way is to say, hmm, these are, this, this was, you could find, for example, that you were asking questions to one group that was quite different from the other. And then what you need to do is write them up separately because they're not talking to each other. You write them up separately. And then you explain what the limitations and, and the strengths of that study are. So one may be, very parent focused in another way and might be more child focused. Or, you know, you your quantitative data was mostly folks with lower levels of education and your your what was supposed to be the parallel study ends up being with people with much more education. I mean any, any number of reasons could account for why you're having these differences. But you have to really grapple. That's the, the bottom line. Um, there's usually a reason why there's why they don't speak to each other. You didn't ask the questions right or you're asking different people with really quite different backgrounds. Please. I think another challenge is that it's not your specialty. So you may have Excellent. to work with other researchers. Excellent. Um, and Experience. I and I noticed that maybe some people think that their way is like superior. Yeah, like I've noticed just from my very small lived experience, what I've seen, the researchers said if they do, like, if they do one kind of way, they think that's more real. More valid and more Yes, real. and I think we know which, we, yeah, the people who do, like, a lot of numbers, I think we... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, a, it's still a quant-dominant world, you're right. Go, keep, keep going, you were yeah. saying something. Yes, I think especially working with um, some communities that are very small, it could be like undocumented mm -hmm. folks or uh, queer and trans mm -hmm. folks, where there isn't a lot of like um, research like in terms of numbers, or if you're, for example, like the other person was talking about with um, Native American folks, if there's like a small population, then, then it might be really hard to make a like a general or blanket statement. Mm -hmm. In fact, it would probably be irresponsible to try yes. to make a generalizable statement. Yes. So what do you think we do then when we're working with like um, marginalized communities or underserved communities? Well, my own philosophical position is that it's um, not entirely responsible to, to take a pure quantitative approach mm -hmm. when you're working with marginalized and you know smaller communities, communities that are numerically less. Um, you know, smaller, or the, or that we know very little about. My, what I think, and in, in, in a lot of people write in this area I think so as well, is you have to first start with a qualitative study, uh, and then a quantitative study. Um, that's, it's just because we don't know enough with a lot of experience, with a lot of folks, we have different kinds of experience, we don't know enough. Um, you know, it, and if you do a quantitative study, then you better draw on other people's research mm -hmm. that is trustworthy, that you've determined is trustworthy. Uh, if you're going to develop a, 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 a survey or instrument, for example, you best know that uh, there's a, other people have been looking at this for a long time. Some so hunches for you to draw on. Mm -hmm. And even so, I think you should call, I personally would be open to the project. But that's my own bias. We all have biases, by the way. Every last one, <laughs> the last one of us. We all have them. The trick is to recognize our biases. So you're, you're absolutely right. So one of the issues is the issue of skills um, and, and experience. People typically often are drawn to, I'm, we're good, thank you. People are often drawn to 
um, the research that they've been trained in, the research that they've read uh, a lot more of. Uh, I mean, notice that only one of you had a mixed method study to, that, yeah, that you had a template in your brain to, to go, oh, that's what it looks like, right? If you're not exposed to something, how do you go and try to do it? Not easy. Uh, and quantitative read, and, and you know, in, in psychology and in some forms of sociology, the quantitative method still is the dominant paradigm. Please. Did you start off like knowing that you wanted to do mixed methods and and kind of because I really like the I really hello I really like the, the uh, idea and the application of it because I am very like application heavy and I wanna. I just don't want to describe anymore. I just I want to actually hit the ground running and mm -hmm. push plans forward. How did you get introduced to mixed uh, methods, and how have you kind of balanced um, honing both those skills at the same time? Um, great question. I'll tell you a little bit about my my how I came to it, um, and then I want to say something about dominances. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I, let me start with that first, and then I w promise you I will answer your question. I'm not avoiding your question. I, will, I believe in answering questions that, get out, that ask me. So, I, a metaphor. How many of you have speak another language besides English? Okay. At UCLA, it's typically uh, about half the class. Uh, so, if you know, so, and how many of you feel absolutely equally capable of have, of writing a paper in both languages? <laughs> the, the number goes way down, right? Uh, because most of us have studied in one language. So most of us uh, have our conversations of intimacy with our loved ones in another language. Uh, we read children's books up until we were, you know, eight in one language, and then we read academic papers in another. So it's very hard to write in a language that you haven't read a whole lot of academic papers in, to write an academic paper. So the point here is that most bilingual folk, trilingual folk, have language dominances. Okay, they have, and or for and for certain things. So very few people are exactly as skilled in both across domains. And I would say that that's also true for most mixed methodologists. So most of us are strongest in one, but have learned to be bilingual enough to follow a conversation and work in with team members. Uh, in the other language. That's a metaphor that is going to be helpful to you when you think about this. Um, and, and so one of the questions you always ask yourself is, was, was this an evenly balanced team or was this a quant dominant or qual dominant team? Uh, which evidence is stronger than the other are both equally... Uh, so I will return to that idea in a second. So how did I get to it? So I'm trained as a clinical psychologist. So my first uh, discipline was, is uh, clinical psychology and so I studied lots of standardized tests and, you know, it is a somewhat quantitative uh, dominant field. Uh, but then I, I, I'm an immigrant, I, my French is my first language, Spanish is my third, and when I was doing uh, rotations I was always being assigned uh, immigrant origin, Spanish speaking families or children, so I work with children and families. Um, and what I realized as I was looking around is there really wasn't very much written about how to do the work well. To really, there wasn't really that many things written about the experience of migration and how it affects people. So that was 25 years ago when I was in your uh, place, well, roughly. Um, and I, you know, I decided I wanted to understand it better. Now, the one thing that helped me a lot is that it, clinical psychologists are good at interviewing. Right? You better be good at interviewing, otherwise you don't do work very well. So that's a skill that I developed as a clinical psychologist, and I was my I was and still am married to an anthropologist. So uh, you know, and I when he was going through grad school, I was working and I was reading a lot of the stuff that he was reading in grad school. So I had kind of a more exposure to a, a, an anthropological qualitative approach than most psychologists. Um, and then I realized that, that the, the instruments that were out there, they didn't work for the kinds of questions I was asking, asking so I had to develop the instruments. Uh, and that meant this kind of back and forth approach. So I started doing mixed methods before people were writing about mixed methods or really calling it mixed methods. And I was doing it in a way that, frankly, still interesting, learned a lot, you know, I contributed to the field, I hope. But uh, I do it now much more systematically. 
um, I, you know, I, I now there, there's a whole language of how to do this kind of work. You know, I, I'm sure you've all read ch chapters on how to do quantitative work or how to do qualitative work or how to do such and such analysis. There's now a whole body of literature on how to do this the way it should be. I also grappled with it a lot. I did a lot of data collection, uh, and then I would need to try to um, tell the story, publish it. And there was a kind of a dearth of places to, to publish it in, and I tried to figure it all out. So I'm here speaking as someone who figured it out. Um, and I think it's the future for a lot of things that we do. And I'm going to be cautionary and, and, and give you some tips on how to approach this work. Um, does that, does yeah. that help? Thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, so when you so we've returned to the issue of skills. Um, very few people, as I say, have solid grounding in both. Uh, and if you don't have solid grounding in the other, uh, the other method or other language, uh, your job is to at least get to the point where you understand the conversation and you go, that sounds wrong. You know, those of you who others speak another language, sometimes you may not be able to produce the sound but you, or produce the sentence, but you know when somebody has a funny accent, right? Or they're not really, there's a grammatical fingernails down the, the blackboard. You need to get to that level of proficiency where you can go, hmm, something's wrong. I need to, you know, talk to somebody who can help me make sure I get it right. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, another uh, challenge of using mixed methods is it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of resources. Um, a lot of time and a lot of resources. Uh, it takes, you know, you're, do, you're gathering double the amount of work, and then you're having to make, you have to analyze double the amount of work, and then you have to make sense of it when there are, when the, the data doesn't converge. So that isn't necessarily the most efficient uh, way of doing the work. It's also expensive, right? It's expensive in terms of time as well as resources. Um, uh, and then, you know, as I said, you don't always have personnel or folks who are equally adept in both kinds of methods. Another reason, another challenge to the field is that there's often you'll encounter, and one of you alluded to that, resistances from, you, you were alluding to that, resistances from folk who don't believe in it, haven't used it, don't think it really tells you much that you couldn't find uh, in, the, in the method of choice. Um, there, another challenge is that it's very complicated. You have double the story to tell. And you know, you've read enough journal articles that you know there's the introduction, and there's the literature review, and then there's the method section. And you have to have a method section for the quant evidence and a method section for the qualitative section. And you have to, to show how the two pieces of evidence speak to one another. And then in the analysis section, you have to do the same thing. And by the time, and there are word limits, and how do you do all that uh, in, in the field? It's, it's, it, especially when reviewers are going, I've never seen this before, I don't even know how to do this. So you have to tell the story, and then reviewers have to judge that the story is, is, uh, is a good one. And then, the, relatedly, there are limited venues in which to, to do, um, you know, present both sets of evidence at the same time. There aren't that many journals that do mixed methods work. There are some, but there aren't that as many. Does that make sense? So any questions so far? Please. So you mentioned that there aren't as many that do mixed methods work. And um, I know that the journal publication business can be really intense and kind of competitive. And I was wondering that if people or if a researcher were to become really proficient at mixed methods work, if that would um, kind of increase their chances of being in those journals, or if those journals are more of a niche, or how that? Well, it, so there are different kinds of journals. So there are journals, so a lot of folks who do mixed methods consider themselves mixed methodologists. That's what they do, it, you know, like statisticians consider themselves statisticians, and they may have some a problem that they study, but really their primary identity is around being a statistician and crunching. Show them the numbers, they'll be able to do it. Uh, mixed method. So some mixed methodologists have their first identity is this is the research I do and this is how I do it, and they're all about naming the the processes and not so much about the topic. 
I, this, I, on the other hand, is, you're looking at me going like, what? So they're, they're totally, okay. Now, when I get a, a wrinkled brow, I know I wasn't uh, okay. I like expressive faces. Um, so what I mean is they're, they're really into uh, justifying what strategies they used and the why. They're like trying to map how to do this work, the, the mixed method approach to work. So some people are like that, and you know, uh, Creswell, John Creswell, who's done a lot of uh, the books that you're likely to, to turn to when you're trying to figure out how to do that. That's what, he, I don't think he's known for the topic he studies so much as the strategy he uses to do that research. I, on the other hand, happen, I don't even really care that much about methodology, other than I know it's a tool. It's like, I don't care how the car runs, I just want the car to run. I need a car, I need to get from point A to point B. I don't need to put it together, or figure, but I, de I need to understand what to do when certain things go wrong, and I need to, you know, there's the things I've got to learn, but I'm not about making the car. I'm about trying to understand specific problems, or challenges, or issues, or phenomena, and I think to, the best way to understand that phenomena is to take these mixed methods approaches. That make sense? Yes. Okay, good. So um, I'm going to make some recommendations uh, to you as you kind of move forward in doing this kind of work, and then we can open it up for Q&A, because I know I'm standing between you and the weekend. Right. <laughs> so that's a hard one to be standing in between. Uh, so you're fed, that's good, uh, but you're tired. And you've been talked at all day, so I, I want to uh, respect that. So as I meant, so here are several, so the good news is you, anything you don't know how to do, you can learn. Okay? Uh, I learned how to do this, you can learn how to do it too. Um, and so the first thing I would suggest is you get a good textbook. So John Creswell, for example, has written, and again, I'll give this, these slides to you if you like. Uh, John Creswell is, has written a lot. There are other people who've written you know, very good textbooks. His is very, see, Dick and Jane run. Put one foot in front of the other. Your introduction should look like this. Your, you know, he's the one who's drawn all these figures that I had up earlier, you know, the arrows and the kind of, and he's really thought a lot about this. And then when you're trying to justify why you do use mixed methods to skeptics, you can say, you can cite somebody who has, you know, who explains why you would use which method when. So if you're serious about mixed methods, this is a nice little textbook. There are many others, but this one's short, not too expensive, and um, it's a good thing to look at. Another thing I would suggest you do is, like the gentleman who, who had an article that he, um, he had read, um, I suggest that you start reading, reading, reading examples of mixed methods. So you can begin to see why, you know, what, what is there, you know, pay me maybe a little bit more attention in that, just, to, okay, let me back up and say, most of us cheat when we read uh, journal articles, and we read that very beginning, like, why do I care, and then they read the discussion section, right? <laughs> Has anybody ever done that before? Okay, all right, good. Well, we, we all have, in the interest of having to get through a lot of reading. However, you know, if you're thinking, if you're contemplating mixed methods approach, you want to uh, start paying attention to how people laid out their logic. Uh, and, um, and, and if you want to try to understand whether you trust the evidence, that's another, you know, you may want to look at how do they come, why do they, how do they justify and how do they do it? So you may want to pay a little bit more attention. And there's this journal, the Journal of Mixed Methods Research, uh, they tend to specialize on the process, the, the why's they do, you know, why do they do certain things when. Uh, there are a lot of examples of articles there, and then there are journals, for example, the Journal of Adolescent Research. I was the editor of that journal for a while, and I made it so that they, we, we, the culture of that journal was to accept mixed method studies, mm -hmm. and uh, an emphasis on qualitative studies because there's lots of adolescent research that emphasizes quantitative. So not that I don't believe in quantitative, because I do. Uh, just there wasn't not, there wasn't there weren't enough venues for that kind of work. And there are others, you know, and you'll always see in the you know in the abstract of the describe the journal, you can see whether they even consider mixed methods. So that's another thing to be looking for. Um, and then the last, you know, another thing that I and I know you can't read that, that's okay, don't worry. Uh, this is just to illustrate an idea. 
um, the, you know, one of the biggest challenges to mixed methods has been that people didn't really have guidelines on how to write thing, how to write mixed methods articles up, how to describe uh, the basic characteristics in what way, and the, the American Psycholo Psychological Association was one of the who is the who published the guidelines. How many of you have had to use APA style? In, in, okay. So you know that they sort of like laid out the guidelines on how you write an article, right? It was purely using a quantitative, up until the sixth manual, which is the one that's most recent, it was all about using you know, a kind of quantitative lens to the article. And there was very little guidance around doing qualitative and none uh, around doing uh, mixed methods. And so just very recently, I was part of a task force, along with John Creswell, who wrote that book, and a few others, to come up with criteria for writing an article, and also to, uh, for editors to judge whether the article was meeting standards. Because you know, a, a quant-dominant uh, researcher might look at my article in mixed methods and go, well, I don't care about the qualitative, and they didn't do this one analysis and throw it out. I mean, they, they didn't really have the kinds of uh, tools to systematically consider what was important in making decisions. So this, this is coming out, I think an article, the, in fact I know, an American Psychologist article sort of has published these, and the next version of, it, of the APA manual, volume seven, will have these guidelines. So that helps the field kind of move forward, because now we have a map. But instead of going, okay, let me figure this out, how am I going, you know, it, is it this, is it that, you know, with echoes? Uh, you know, sending off echoes and trying to figure out what, what to do next, you actually have a map. That makes sense? So those are things that I would suggest you all do. Um, and then, you know, if you decide, are any of you tempted to maybe do mixed methods? Good. I'm trying to tempt you. That's good. So I'm going to give you some, uh, some suggestions. Um, so the first thing I would say is always start with your research questions. Is your research question a research question? that is best answered, it, 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 there are, back up, there are research questions that are quantitative, and there are research questions that are qualitative in nature. Um, and they're quite different from one another. So you, you, you craft your questions, and then you look at the question, you go, is this a question that needs to be answered quantitatively? Is this a question that needs to be answered qual quantitatively? qualitatively, or is this one that there needs to be a sub-question or, or an accompanying question that is using complementary methods? If the answer, and I have, I, if the answer is one method is enough, then stick to one method. But if you need both methods to understand what your phenomena, then you use both. Sir? Um, I guess my question would be exactly how do, how do we do that? How do we determine if our research would you know, fit um, a quantitative uh, uh, mixed methods because if it, if it's something that can be studied either or, how can we tell if, if it's something that we should do and quantitative? Okay, that's to, oh wow, that's a that's a great question. Um, well, you know, I would I start by asking myself, um, well, what am I what's what am I interested in? Is this a a, a why or you know is is X related to Y kind of question? Is, you know, is one phenomenon related to another question, then it's probably a quantitative study. If, if there are measures out there that, that you can draw upon, if there's a, enough basis of evidence, uh, and there are, then it's, that's probably the most efficient strategy. If you're working with a population which we don't know much about, um, if you're still mapping the experience, then you have to start with a qualitative. And if you get to a question where, okay, well, we know some things, but we, so we know this about, say, African-American folk in, in, that are from the U.S., but we don't know much about black immigrants coming from Jamaica. So the measures that we have so far are, are, are accurate for, you know, we think are fairly accurate for one group, but we really haven't, ex we haven't applied it to this other group. Then you would want to do a mixed method approach where you first look at the measure and adapt it with some focus groups or you know initial interviews with folks in the community to make sure you're asking the right questions. So you might be leaving out really important questions in the questionnaire. That's an example of when. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. John Creswell has a terrific article on, uh, not in this book, but it's actually available online. If you go Creswell 
and um, qualitative and quantitative questions. There's an article of that, that kind of lays out what kinds of questions you ask, which way another, what kinds of questions you ask another way. I still refer to it all the time. Okay, so uh, if you're going to do this, so you start with good research questions, and you let the research question guide, research or research questions guide, which strategy you use. Be curious. You know, don't foreclose your findings before uh, you've even found them. You know, I mean, that's one of my problems with hypothesis testing. I mean, I, I do believe in hypothesis testing, and we always have hunches, even in qualitative research, about what we might find. Uh, so you don't need to go in blind, but you don't want to foreclose what you don't know, right? And what, I mean, the whole point of this is to learn about what you don't know uh, and to expand the field. Um, be creative. You know, there's the, 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 one of the things I love about mixed methods work is that it is more creative. Uh, and, you know, you have to be flexible and you have to figure out when, what works and what doesn't work. Uh, you're doing a lot of adjustment along the way. So if you, if you like things this way, probably you shouldn't do mixed methods. And, you know, we're, I'm a psychologist. I believe in personality styles. We all have different personality styles. Um, there's no right or wrong way. But there is a, you know, it be, if you're a creative person and you are interested in trying to figure out how things are, then I suggest that that's a good way to approach it. Um, and what do I mean by color within the lines of your discipline? Um, it's important for you to know uh, what your discipline values and how to speak to folks in your discipline. So I think one of the reasons why I've drawn so heavily on qualitative work is because my discipline has been a little blind to the phenomena of immigration. Like sociologists are all over immigration. Psychologists have not been. Even though 25% of all kids, 26% now, of all kids in this country have an immigrant parent. And never mind LA or San Francisco or New York, right? So it's a phenomena that affects a whole lot of people, but psychology has been like, okay, we can't measure it. Um, there are, it's, it, you know, there are, we don't want to touch it. Um, and so I, I've, I've always been sort of pushing around margins saying, well, I think it's important and I'm going to try to figure out how to do it and there isn't a, a simple way to do it and each study gets a little better, I hope. I wasn't as good at it when I started as I am now. Um, but it was, um, but I also knew how to talk to my discipline. I knew how to write an article in quant terms and then give them a taste of what the qualitative piece feels like. I, 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 I learned to be flexible, and that, you know, that's what, when you're bilingual, you do that. You learn to be flexible. You learn when to use what, what, which language when. But always understand that you have an audience. You know, there's always, somebody is reading what you're reading, somebody is listening to what you're saying. So always try to figure out who is, you know, who am I speaking to? Am I speaking to a group of practitioners? Am I speaking to, in which case you will use different kinds of language and ask different kinds of questions. Or are you um, speaking to your committee that happen to be all very quant dominant and you're going to have to sort of like get through using that language. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, know thyself. Meaning, know, you know, it's good to stretch yourself. I believe in stretching. But also don't go completely against type. So I am fully identified as a qualitative dominant uh, researcher. That's my dominant language. I know how to do, I know how to be in a room with folks who do quantitative work. But I have dyscalculia. Do you know what that is? It's like dyslexia with numbers. I know. So sorry. Uh, it's horrible when you try to do long division. Really not fun in statistics either. So I mean, I went with my type. I didn't give up on it. I didn't try to not do it at all because obviously, you know, you have to be a psychologist. If you have to be a psychologist, you've got to have the statistics classes and you've got to be able to read the articles. But I also knew that I was pushing too hard. You know, that was not going to be my strength. On the other hand, I'm a pretty good interviewer. Uh, I really know how to relate with people. I know how to get in there. Um, so why not draw on your strengths? Again, you start with a question. So you, I, I'm not telling you. You have a question to ask? No, me? stretching. I'm okay. Sorry. All right. Good. Yeah. I, okay. I'm gonna get you out very soon. I do have a question though. Later. Okay. Um, so <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me without this? I can, oh, but okay. but uh, but they're like they're, they're trying to record. So. Okay. Uh, my question 
with my research, I'm not too sure if I'm gonna, I'm still digging, but if I can't find a lot of quantitative research to go with what I'm researching, can I like have something that kind of introduces my research in, when it comes to quantitative, like I'm gonna, you know, like would I start with something quantitative of numbers that's kind of like going into my problem that I'm researching? If there's almost nothing out there on your field, probably you want to start with qualitative study. Unless you're unless you're simply trying to describe prevalence, for example. If you're doing a, you know, this happens in the X amount of whatever your population is that you're looking at, then you'll want to do a quantitative study. But if you're trying to understand a phenomena that nobody's described very well yet, then you might want to start by asking people who know something about that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Good. Uh, just since he asked that question, um, I'm kind of curious because the the sequential uh, that explan explanatory version that seems very logical to me. Uh, the exploratory version, I'm just curious to know what the smallest sample size is that you've ever seen used effectively with that. Uh, explanatory. With a call it where we start with, with the... We're starting with the quantitative and going towards the qualitative. The, the smallest sample. Like um, what, yeah. have you, you know, seen... 60-ish 60, like, 60 would probably, for the, for the quant, and then 6 to 10 for the qual. That would be about as small as is, you know, legitimate. And that brings up kind of one of the questions for the work that you are doing, right? I remember that I said, that because, you know, I've done work with funding from the Ford Foundation, and the National Science Foundation, and, you know, other foundations. I came in with funding to do the work, and, you know, some of the work was five years long. You, many of you, as your first research project, are likely you doing a small-scale study as part of a thesis. And so that kind of, okay, I'm going to, it'll get me to the next slide, uh, which is a reality check. Right, um, which is you know, can you do what you are? It's great to start by dreaming that this would be the ideal uh, set of studies I'd like to do, but then you have the okay, I've got one year to accomplish this in, from start to finish, from dreaming it up to get it, gathering the data, analyzing the data, writing it up. What can you do with the time you have and the resources you have? So. And there's nothing wrong with going, okay, the first stage of my study is going to be to do this piece of it. And then my next one is going to be the next piece. You can, that you can do these sequential approaches. Uh, so don't feel like you're less than because you've done that. Uh, but, I, but I have seen lots of people go, oh, I've heard about this method. That sounds like fun. I want to do that. And then they don't have the time to get it accomplished in the time that they have. So, the reality principle is pretty important. Uh, and going back, uh, because this is like being bilingual, you should always work with somebody who's maybe a little more dominant in the other field, who can help you if, to, to back translate, if you will, uh, if something is you know, not quite right. Or also to help you make plans. So this work is really well done in collaboration. So I'm just about at the end. So be realistic, uh, but also enjoy the journey. I mean, the research is fun. I know it's scary sometimes, but it's actually, and it can be sound tedious, but once you get into it, it's kind of fun. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna read But, you know, it is, you, you learn stuff that you wouldn't have found out any other way. Um, and so enjoy the, the, the journey. You're going to a new lands. Uh, you know, explore new territory, but do it in a way that you uh, think, you know, just enjoy the process. And know the frustrations come with, you know, with the trip, on the trip, but in the end you, you do this.